five respondents. Um, and we really need to stay because I feel the sense of lunch coming and, this, uh, and stomachs growling. So we're really going to ask the respondents, because there's so much material here, we're going to have three minutes per respondent. I don't even have time to put up the card. I'm just going to say time's up and we'll have to move on. To really just get to what is your most important point you would like to respond to that all of us can uh, reflect on. And so with that, uh, I'm going to start first uh, with KC. Uh, KC, I will my co-chair has helped me with that, uh, who has had, ex we met in Delhi, has had extensive experience in terms of government and planning and many different roles uh, to begin our discussion. Casey. Thank you. Uh, I'll try and focus my brief comments on what has been presented and also the questions uh, that were listed in the program. <clears throat> Number one, are cities planned in India? It would be very easy to bring this discussion to a close and say <laughs> cities are not planned. One minute silence in honor of planning. End of the session. That's one way of looking at it. Yeah. Neighborhoods are planned. Buildings are planned. Shopping malls are planned. F facilities for sports are planned. Cities as cities are not planned. And they have not been planned for some time. And if you are not prepared to accept that reality, then I'm afraid much of your time is wasted. Second, Policies and you know, institutions, concepts. We hear about a world-class city. <clears throat> Whose concept is this world-class city? Who gave it to us? Whose world? Whose city? I can hear of a world-class soccer stadium. I can hear of a world-class airport. I can <coughs> probably hear of a world-class hotel, as the Elton Towers. But what is a world-class city? We have not had a concept or an attitude about city for quite some time. As long as the Mings and the emperors and the Indian great kings and the Mughals were there, there was an imperial purpose. There was a dominant purpose. There was a defense purpose. When there was a religious purpose. When those major purposes are gone, what is the concept that we just, you know, float around ourselves? Third, what is this deference and genuflection to the so-called private sector? Why? What is the private sector so different from the rest of the society? It's wonderful to hear our friend from Singapore to say that design is a matter of public realm. It's not a matter of private negotiation and private deal making. Here we are in Asian cities trying to dismantle the public realm, trying to forget what ourselves, what we ourselves contributed to the concept of settlements and cities. If you want to hack that public realm all the time, you do not have the right <coughs> to talk about a city which is for the people. Fourth, the instruments. That is again a question. What are the instruments? Same old toolbox. Same old planners box, same old regulations and so on. Again, we are trying to fiddle around with some adjustments. You hear all these various things. One of the things that appears to be, and I'm very impressed by what Umar Samuli presented in regard to Bombay. And you find in all these city presentations, except in Singapore, this so-called conflict between the city and the region, the city and the state. Over a long period of time, we have been used to a limited municipal construct. The, say, the De Civitas Dei, the De Civitas Populi, small little controlled areas. But today's <laughs> urban world is multi-municipal, multi-jurisdictional, and there are many, 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 many actors, and these are going to be inevitable. In such a situation, we are busy negotiating space for various people, but we are not necessarily negotiating the space for the people themselves, represented by local government. I hope some of you noticed in the case of Bombay, she made a reference to the Metropolitan Planning Committee. A Metropolitan Planning Committee, which consists of elected representatives, brings different municipal jurisdictions on a platform. Seven years the legislation has been there. Only Calcutta, 
has set up the Metropolitan Planning Committee. Why? Because there is a certain amount of political reluctance <coughs> to create and support a platform where contestation and argument will take place. In many of these cities, the state and the national government, whether they have a role or not, try to inveigle themselves into what is essentially a space that is to be determined by local choice. And if you abandon public realm, then in that case, you know, that local choice is also subdued, is also sort of, you know, uh, is also <coughs> uh, given up. So from that point of view, as Uma mentioned, and this is applicable to others, you have a Metropolitan Development Authority which was born in good faith, but today it continues in bad faith because you are not prepared to accept the alternatives. So I think the problem to all this basic question, how cities are planned, whose city, for whom, if you are not prepared to ask that question, that you are not ready for this debate. Thank you. <laughs> Rahul Narotov, uh, who's now at uh, Professor at MIT, and has done extensive work here. Rahul. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I think I, I want to sort of pick up on two points which uh, were to do with integration, and I want to add to the discussion by raising something which I think has been absent in the discussions, which is the issue of making a transition. How do you move from one to the other, uh, especially in the context of these visions? And I, I couldn't help, there's a kind of neatness in the presentations we saw, so I couldn't help but uh, think about the sessions from yesterday, especially the one about inequality. And I think what we are trying to do is reconcile or blur these many binaries that seem to face us in these cities, a formal, informal city, periphery, you know, all the rest of it. Uh, and how do we do that? And I think that's a critical uh, question for design. Darren yesterday used the word kinetic, which I thought was wonderful, because I think Bombay is the ultimate kinetic city. Uh, it's a city uh, where clearly architecture is not the spectacle of the city. Architecture doesn't represent it. There's a whole lot of other stuff that happens here. For me, the Ganesh Festival is a wonderful intersection of community and identity, and it leaves no trace. It has no codification. The images of Singapore, the images we saw of Pudong, uh, are clearly representative of societies where uh, architecture is the spectacle of the city. And so I think when we talk about integration, we have to recognize uh, other sensibilities of way urban space is used. And I think the kinetic city has a number of uh, lessons for us there, uh, uh, lessons of temporal use, uh, of how landscapes can shift and adjust. Uh, you know, I get, I'm really amused uh, uh, in America when people in their cities celebrate and make this great effort to introduce farmers markets uh, to humanize their cities. And, you know, more than 50% of our cities are farmers, farmers market and we are trying to dehumanize our cities in the kinds of visions that we project. And so I think this notion of the kinetic city, the notion of uh, different sensibilities have to be part of uh, the effort of integration. So it's beyond land use, it's about also spatial uh, sensibility. And this is not to do just with the city of the poor. The rich use the city like that in Bombay. I mean, if you drive on Marine Drive, you have these wonderful maidans there, these open spaces. And in the evening, after the sportsmen have left, they get transformed into these spectacular spectacular venues for weddings. Of course, weddings are an outlet for ostentation in our society, and that's a whole different issue. But it's just wonderful how the city can actually expand its margins temporarily, leave no trace, and in the morning, the cricketers are back there on turf that has been untouched. And in the process, there's craftsmanship, there's employment, and there's a spectacle which is about, I think, about identity. And so I refer to Richard Sennett, who yesterday, I think, gave us some, shared with us some wonderful insights about urban design, scale issues of complexity, uh, overdetermined form, public space, uh, the notion that contact is more critical than, uh, uh, that, than identity, and et cetera. And I think uh, these questions lie more in the kinetic city than where we are actually locating them. And the last issue of transition, the reason I bring this up is, I think like in the question of energy, when we are trying to move, you know, get out of fossil fuels, we have to make transitions through other modes of energies, and that's a recognized model. I think we've got to ask that question for cities. We can't jump from our present situation to some ideal condition. The city here is not about grand design, it's about grand adjustment. Thank you. And we'll turn now to Enrique Norton, architect in Mexico City and now in New York, to pick up on this. 
Well, thank, you, uh, thank you very much, Professor Altman. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I want to uh, share a reflection, uh, uh, probably a preoccupation and maybe a little bit of a provocation. Uh, as, I have, uh, as I sit through these conferences and at the same time visit uh, new cities to me, uh, like, like uh, Mumbai and other Asian cities, uh, I get a, a, a bit concerned that we are seeing that uh, the, the proposals that we hear here uh, are mostly what I would consider, or I, I fear they would be, most of them obsolete solutions, uh, uh, very outdated mechanisms and many stereotypes that are based basically on a very failed profession, which is planning of the 20th century. Uh, we, have, we have seen that planners, and please, uh, I don't mean to offend anyone, and excuse me, uh, have only showed us a totally lack of imagination. I don't think, I don't think that the, the, the two-dimensional city that we have been using for the last hundred years has anything to do with the city of the future. Here we are sitting in Mumbai, a, a city that obviously is eager to reinvent itself, you know, and become one of those cities of the 21st centuries. And again, we are looking at solutions of 19th century and maybe first half of the 20th century. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, or I wish, you know, we could, uh, you know, have here more, more visionaries. You know, we cannot keep on looking at plans, plans by meaning two-dimensional representations of cities uh, or statistics and, and a series of numbers, you know. We're seeing no visionary work. You know, why aren't cities investing in vision? You know, in vision, and I mean physical vision, a multidimensional vision. I very strongly believe the city of the future is a multidimensional city uh, that does not relate to the pre-modern city or to the many failures of the first half or middle of the last century. Uh, of the last century, we are uh, here facing more densification, more congestion, and at the same time, we need to invent more new public space. And the only way to be able to do that is to start thinking literally in a multidimensional city. By that, I don't mean building high only, because that, that is still, uh, if public uh, uh, space keeps on being just a two-dimensional condition, we're doing nothing. You know, we can see certain moments in Singapore, which I visited recently, that are really thinking into the future. Hong Kong, maybe uh, other, uh, city, uh, Tokyo in certain aspects, but I think cities like Mumbai, cities like Shanghai, cities like Dubai, and Shanghai and Dubai are already gone, you know, but Mumbai has a great possibility for that future. Uh, so I, I would, that's really what I wanted to share, you know, why aren't we looking into the multidimensional city of the 21st century and please stop looking at the failed planning profession of the last century. Thank you very much. Uh, we now turn to uh, Barun Kumare from the uh, Secretary of the Calcutta Metropolitan Development Authority. And I'll, I'll still talk to you even though you've offended me, uh, Enrique, and the entire profession of planning. We can still have a drink tonight. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. Okay. No, we're friends. It's okay. We'll talk about architecture later. Well, I'll start by <clears throat> relating a small anecdote. If you were to make God laugh, what would you do? You should go up. If you, if you were to make God laugh, what would you do? Tell him your plans. <laughs> I think while we discuss about uh, whether cities can be planned or not, I'm sure God will be convulsed with laughter. Anyway, the point that I'd like to stress upon here today is the, uh, the conflict that we have between central planning and local planning. We have been discussing about this in our, uh, over the past two days. And I feel that this is the biggest issue that, has, that confronts a city government today. The problem of multi multiplicity of plans and agencies and the ad hocism in planning that we have, especially in India, that is the, I think, the biggest challenge that is confronting large cities like Mumbai or Kolkata or for that matter, Delhi. It would be, very important for us to resolve these issues 
And to resolve these issues, as uh, we have tried to do in Kolkata, we have a Metropolitan Planning Committee which has representations from various chairpersons and <coughs> representatives of the panchayat areas. For example, Kolkata, just like Mumbai, the metropolitan area encompasses a large portion more than the city core as such, which in Mumbai as well as in Calcutta, I would say is about 10% of the entire metropolitan area. So unless we have representatives and the aspirations of people living in the fringe areas is met, it is very difficult for us to prepare the development plans or the uh, plans for the city and plan as a whole. Secondly, we have been passed down uh, the, uh, by the 74th Amendment Act of the Constitution. The 12th schedule of the Constitution says that there are 18 functions which have been devolved to the uh, city governments. But where is the city government? As we have been seeing, especially in India, the city government is non-existent. So <clears throat> the point that I'm trying to make is that we may plan and we may plan, but where do we finance those plans? What would be the role of the state in you know, partly uh, implementing these plans. And the issues of convergence and governance, which is very important, I think we should dwell upon in our deliberations. Thank you. Thank you. And now to Mauricio a different part of who works uh, with uh, uh, Mauricio, Special Advisor in International Relations uh, to the Mayor of Mexico City. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, really uh, like very much this dubious honor of being the last one to speak before the lunch break because it is surely uh, makes everybody think, I hope this Mexican guy finishes up quite quickly so I can go taste the chicken curry. <laughs> and that, so I'll be very brief. Um, first, uh, I can agree more with KC, but I have uh, some things uh, uh, that also have to be put into consideration. One is that uh, given a competitive uh, and the uncertain economic uh, environment, um, the cities need uh, what's been uh, said here, what we can certain from all these two days is that cities uh, uh, need uh, to evolve into competitive uh, strategic planning to uh, get the most uh, effect effective planning out of their limited financial and human resources to achieve the targets. Uh, the, it's uh, certain that the capital available to any given city is uh, highly elastic and uh, only flows to cities that show potential and thought, show well thought out uh, uh, planning urban futures. In that sense, uh, one uh, key challenge in spite of uh, uh, cities' particular governance issues or due to them in many cases is uh, that in order to be, and to have, to be more efficient uh, service providers and, and wealth uh, uh, generators, uh, the planning of the city's development strategies has to comprise well-positioned and well-timed uh, public, private, and civil society strategic interventions in order to significantly be able to alter for the better uh, the development path of the cities. If these three sectors uh, act uh, harmoniously and uh, decisively, uh, changes are likely to go faster and deeper, and this is uh, particularly important uh, uh, for planners and policymakers as uh, lots of empirical evidence show that uh, changes uh, of cities can be done in enormous uh, uh, ways uh, and time spans as short as uh, 10 to 20 years. Uh, that's one of the things, uh, reflections I have to make. And the other one is uh, very quickly about what Sheila Dixit said, to, said today about giving word of the constituency. Uh, we couldn't agree more. Uh, Major Brad in Mexico City uh, has uh, uh, to be able to give the best for the public interest and how What's a better way to do it? Well, to be able to give the people a little bit of voice. And in that sense, I'd like to share in this last 30 minutes, 30 seconds I have, uh, one uh, experience we had very recently in July, uh, given uh, that climate change, uh, as Nick Stearns uh, very brilliantly put today in his uh, uh, keynote presentation, is one of the key issues for uh, societies and one of the foremost challenges. Mayor Brad Post in July, a green referendum that uh, started uh, with the people up uh, with the younger generations of up to 14 uh, age, age olds because we sincerely think that in ethical terms and practical terms, uh, this is the generation that we're going to give the, the, the city uh, as an inheritance of the, so they should have 
uh, so they should be able to, uh, to have a word. Uh, so he put up a green referendum uh, with 10 fundamental points uh, uh, asking if uh, we should invest more in uh, infrastructure to build uh, new pathways and uh, uh, second uh, roadways to uh, tend to use more vehicles, or if we should go to the other way around uh, and to build uh, more tramways and uh, uh, alternative uh, systems, uh, massive of massive transportation. Well, the results were outstanding. Uh, we had uh, one million and a half people voting uh, to uh, be able to produce a, a city more oriented towards the green environment. And that was for us uh, one very effective way to uh, involve people in uh, active uh, public policy and to give uh, policymakers good sound policies. Thank you very much. Thank you. We, um, we have time for, uh, we have five minutes, and I think what I'd like to do, there are many, many questions that have been asked. Many are very specific to Mumbai. Many are proposals. Uh, many are specific questions to people. But I, I think I'd like to take the opportunity to try to connect some of these in a question of what we've heard. We've heard in the opening presentation yesterday about what's happening with urbanization, the scale of urbanization, the velocity, how quickly it's happening, the complexity of it, of different peoples, migrations, populations. So there's an enormous rate of change happening on the one hand. We have, as we heard from Tony Travers, systems, we're going to hear more from Joe Frug, of governance that may or may not align with what is the very notion of the city, the regional city, what uh, the local city, the right governance structure to deal with urbanization. We heard from Philip Rota about how planning systems may or may not be even capable, have the capacity or be integrated to deal with this complexity, let alone the mismatch between planning systems, governance systems, and the scale of urbanization. And then we have the whole issue that's come up is in the Dharavi discussion about community processes, democratic processes from Shanghai where the government's able to implement uh, unimpeded to more robust conversations like we had in Dara about Dharavi of different levels of protest and participation that are able to happen here in Mumbai and a whole continuum. So we have whole different systems operating. The question that I think would be, I I'm interested in, I think we're interested in the urban age, is how to connect the physical, the social, the economic, the governance together. And the one thing I think would be interesting since we have a panel here, a unique opportunity with architects, with planners, uh, with different uh, senior level government people, the role of place. Where is the role of the physical place of the city? What you talked about, Enrique, to go from two-dimensional to three-dimensional, these abstract planning systems, the abstract notions of governance, all of these things that can operate at a very grand level. And when we looked yesterday, Rahul, and we'd be on your tour, and we talked about the mills and said planning can set the FSI, the density, can set the open space, but what about the physical place? So I'm curious maybe to get some reaction about how do we bring place and design from the ground up, if you will, the DNA, the uniqueness of these cities into this larger conversation of the big planning systems that are out there that may or not may not be working, and then we don't lose what it is that ultimately is so special and defines uh, the identity of place and cities. So I'd be curious to open that up for three minutes of discussion uh, before lunch. Well, I mean, I, I think it seems to me that, I mean, I think governance becomes the, the key issue here because, uh, I mean, we seem, you know, we seem to, we, we, I think we're all seeming to recognize that that's a key sort of uh, missing block and how that can actually percolate down these, 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 these different sort of levels uh, at which the city operates. Uh, and I, anyway, it just seems to me that's sort of the key missing sort of piece. I think... <clears throat> In regard to space, you also have to look at it from a scale. I think at the neighborhood level, at the city level, what uh, Mr. Mehrotra has already mentioned, Asian cities, Indian cities, world cities, the people have shown that space is not static. It is dynamic. It can be used and reused in different ways to connect itself to the different functions of the city. One of the very, very bad tools we have inherited from 19th century, as Enrique points out, 
is a set of color pens which says conforming land use, non-conforming land use. And as long as there is ink in the magic marker, we are busy plotting non-conforming uses. They do not conform in the planner's mind, they eminently conform in the people's mind. One. Two, the concept of gated communities is not restricted to communities. It is being elevated to the city scale, to the metropolitan scale. In a way, it was elevated in that manner in regard to Joe Berg, as, as uh, you know, Joe Beale pointed out. It's the same thing that is now taking place. Parts of the city with access, parts of the city without access, parts of the city with infrastructure. What we are doing here in India in the name of special economic zones, we are creating brand new privately owned company towns and they have already made a demand, we want freedom from tax, we want freedom from everything, we also want freedom from the constitution. So that we would like all the people living in this special economic zone to be loyal citizens to the company. So therefore I think this business of space, we have to recognize space as a multiple entity, space as a scale entity, and the space should be decided by the people not preempted by the market in advance. And that is what is happening across different Asian cities. Thank you. Uh, Tony Travers? <clears throat> in the context of all those maps and charts that we were looking at earlier on, there's no doubt that however configured planning for transport or for city and land use <laughs> development is inevitably a <coughs> top-down in, top institutional thing where clearly people constitute a place and they have views upon it. And I think the, the issue that the urban age throws up again and again, these conferences throw up again and again, is how these institutional mechanisms, which are inevitable and to some extent, well, some people don't think they are, but I think they are almost inevitable, how they can be sensitive to people and place. And I think we have to recognize that there is a conflict here, an inevitable conflict, and the, you know, the, the, the micro-political issue is how to reconcile those conflicts by these big institutions to people in communities and in cities that are developing, and almost all the urban age cities are growing and developing, the conflicts between the citywide institutions or the statewide institutions and individuals in their neighborhoods will always be significant. They really will. Can I just make one more small, um, small point before? I mean, part of it, you can talk about structures as much as you want, but if there is a sort of an aspirational side to which you're talking about, unless you plug into those structure, someone with those skills high up, such as a city architect, not just a city planner, someone advising the key politicians, that's how it works in the UK. Um, the mayor is advised by Richard Rogers, as it happens in London, which probably has had an impact in terms of the vision which is being set. Unless you do that, you don't solve the problem just by playing around with structures of decision making. Uh, the yeah. final word, Enrique. Well, just to answer to your question, which I think it's a very well formulated question and I think it's a very important question. I don't think there are universal solutions, obviously. I don't think there are even uh, universal solutions in within a city. You know, I think our cities, especially cities of the complexity of Mumbai and many others that we have been discussing, uh, require very specific uh, proposals and very specific solutions for each one of their many, many pieces and elements of each one of the city. And at the end, the city will be a sum of many good solutions. And all I wish, and, and I agree completely, obviously, with what Ricky just described, uh, you know, unfortunately uh, for the rest of the world, London is a highly sophisticated city, and it's very difficult to apply those conditions to many of the other cities that we are discussing, you know, being in, precisely London, one of those pre-modern cities with a very strong pre-modern structure. So now it's, a li it, it's, it's other, the issues that London deals with. Uh, I, I only wish that people that are making decisions in our city would believe more in creation and imagination, you know, and less in formulaic <laughs> solutions. Thank you. Great. On that note, let's thank everyone here. It's been a very rich session.